questions at the end, but I'll give you in that case Sir Stuart Clark and the Unknown Universe. Stuart. Well, thank you very much, Robert, and uh, thank you all for coming. I notice um, how Robert optimistically says we're going to enjoy the next hour. So, um, <laughs> so this is the um, this is the first time. Um, that I've actually given this lecture, although I have been thinking about these kinds of topics for a number of years now. And it really has evolved out of what I think it should be one of the defining characteristics of a scientist, and that's scepticism. And so one of the things that I wanted to try to look at was to see why we have built the, the edifice of understanding that we have about the universe, how we have come to this, why we believe in it so wholeheartedly and why we now routinely interpret new results within this framework and this model. And then just to play the devil's advocate and try to pick at some of the assumptions that are in there and to see how easy it might be to make this fall down. So we'll, I'll talk in, um, in some detail this afternoon uh, about um, these assumptions. It doesn't mean that they're not correct, but I've chosen to pick on the ones that are not yet proven to see what might happen. And that's why this is called the unknown uh, universe. And as usual with my talks, they're frankly just pathetic attempts to sell my latest book. <laughs> uh, and this one, I'm hoist on my own petard because the, the, the subject was so deep and it took me so much longer um, to actually get into it. And I finally found myself having to actually delve down into both the history and the philosophy of science in order to understand why our thinking about the universe has changed and why we can hold such stock in key assumptions that the book is not ready. It won't be out until <coughs> September. It is now finished, so at least I can probably complete the talk. Um, but uh, yes, the book is um, not quite out yet. So here is um, a bit of a, a smorgasbord um, of, the, of, of the whole unknown universe. And let's begin... Actually, let's, let's begin by saying it's summer and taking my jacket off uh, and watching a movie. Um, this is the, the Planck satellite, the European Space Agency's microwave mapping satellite. It was launched in 2009, and then for the next three or so years, it looked at the whole sky and showed us a picture of what the universe would look like if we could see in microwave eyes. So this was scanning both for the, uh, the very oldest light in the universe and some of the very youngest as well. And the oldest light was coming from uh, the, the fireball of the Big Bang, this moment of beginning. And the youngest light was coming from, from dust clouds um, very close by. This was the image that was um, the first released, the first of the, these all-sky images from Planck. And uh, I was working, actually, for, as the senior editor for space science at the European Space Agency when we were trying to work out exactly um, how to promote this image. And we went through kind of a number of, of iterations with it. The key stuff um, for, the, for the cosmology, to understanding the origin of the universe, is the, sort of, is the mottling on here, this, this stuff. And this is, in effect, the blueprint for all the structures we see in the universe today. This is, is derived from extremely, faint, uh, extremely small variations in the density of matter throughout the early universe. And to tease people with this, because this is where the real, um, the real cosmological science is, um, superimposed on the top of it is all the, the, the young light, the emission of these microwaves from dust clouds very, very close to us. 
partly this was released like this so that people couldn't start scanning these fluctuations and doing the science that the Planck team were themselves um, in the process of doing. But it was whilst looking at this image that um, it, it struck me that actually encoded on here is the entire history of our universe. This is it in one single picture. Because we have the oldest light that we can see from um, just after the Big Bang and this young light here and many different points in between. Um, it's, there's certain galaxies. If I'd got a higher resolution movie, um, you could have seen it much more easily. But there's a galaxy here, an active galaxy um, here. There's the Magellanic Clouds down here. There's the Orion star forming region over here, Barnard's Loop. It, it's just all there for you to see. The question is, what does it all mean? And when we think we know what it means, how do we test it? And there's the key. You science must be falsifiable. You must be able to develop a hypothesis which is testable. And what we were seeing on this image was really um, extremely interesting. When it was finally... F oh, I, there we go. I did put a high-resolution version. There's that, um, uh, the active galaxy, Centaurus A, up there. Um, there's the Andromeda galaxy over there, very near to us. Here's Barnard's Loop here, surrounding the Orion um, region and the Magellanic Clouds. And this is, uh, is the Milky Way. This is the, um, this is the Vela supernova um, in here. So everything is on here. All of that foreground emission had to be stripped away to get to the cosmological information um, at the back. And that's what happened over the next few years. And this is the result. So these colour-coded images are the it's microwaves and it shows you the fluctuations in the density of matter in the early universe. As I've said, the blueprint for what our universe has become. And in the course of our cosmology, what we have um, discovered is there appears to be a large amount of the universe that we can't actually see. So you've probably all heard of things like dark matter and dark energy. And this, so this image can uh, be modelled um, with computer simulations that try to work through the laws of physics that we know of to give us some kind of idea about how this kind of pattern comes about. And interestingly enough, when we do that and we feed in the amounts of dark matter and dark energy that we think are in the universe today and the amounts of normal matter, the atoms, we still find that we can't fully reproduce this image. There's some anomalies on here. So one of them is down here. This is called the cold spot here. It's very unclear how we can get um, that image. It's a, it, it corresponds to, some, uh, to a rarefied region of the, the, the gas. The fluctuation is, a, is, a, is quite low there. Uh, there's other anomalies. It's if you look at this sweep of, of sort of red here and this sweep of deep blue here, that's showing you that the fluctuations on this side of the sky are slightly um, higher and lower, so just deeper overall, than the fluctuations on this side of the sky. That's very difficult for us to explain with our current models and ideas of how the universe began and subsequently evolved. And yet, it's so close to being correct that we can actually explain this, that it, it, it's very persuasive that we must be significantly along the right lines. It seems almost impossible to believe that there can be so much of a coincidence that we can get so close to the right answer and have wrong assumptions. As I've mentioned, those assumptions are 
that the matter that we see just makes up a tiny fraction. So before Planck, um, the models suggested about 4.5%. After Planck, that went up a little bit. Um, then there's this dark matter, unseen stuff, particles, we think, which we've yet to discover, that can come out of a plethora of particle physics theories. Um, they make up um, almost a quarter. Again, we, we, things f move slightly differently after Planck. And then the majority of the, the matter and energy in our universe is, is this dark matter. It's something that we have no clue what it is. There's no natural fit for whatever this substance, force, energy is in our current theories of physics. If you think you're on the right lines with it in one direction, you throw something completely out in the other, as we'll discuss later on. And the more I looked at this, the more I thought, well, what we're doing here with these models, we put all of this all, all together in a, big, uh, in, in a big computer simulation, and the amounts of, of matter, dark matter and dark energy, we then tweak and fiddle with until we get something, a simulation that looks similar to that Planck model. And on the face of it, that's absolutely fine. But what we've done is just include the only two things that a force can do. So dark matter gives us a little bit of pull. Dark energy gives us push. And then we're trying to balance that around what we know to exist, which is the ordinary matter. And at one level, that's absolutely fine. I mean, it's the obvious and the sensible thing to do. But it doesn't tell us a thing about what the dark matter and the dark energy actually are. And, and there's very little else you can actually do it, other than put some push and pull into the model. So, we need to now try to understand what these things are, if they're real, and how they might come about. But before we do that, uh, let me just talk a little bit about models in science. So, <coughs> science is about uncovering the laws of nature. You know, physics, the fundamental physics of the universe is about developing these ideas, these mathematical descriptions of the forces of nature. And with those mathematical descriptions, we can start to investigate processes that take place. However, if we want to investigate um, an individual celestial object or a class of celestial objects, then it becomes a little more difficult. Say, for example, uh, that we want to investigate the interior of a star. Arthur Eddington, in the 1920s, had exactly this kind of ambition. And in order to make any progress at all, he actually had to redefine somewhat the way that science works. And he came up against great opposition from the physicist James Jeans. Jeans believed that the, 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 the um, crowning glory of science was its route to certain knowledge. And that meant the investigation of processes where you could see the input and measure the output. And the science part of it came in understanding what was happening in the process. In the case of a star, you can never see the interior of the star. So you can't measure the input, what's actually going on. So genes believed that trying to understand the nature of a star was not scientific. Eddington said you can make progress, but... You have to relinquish the certainty with which you can know whether you're right or wrong. You can only start talking about probable circumstances. 
So you can, you can certainly measure how much energy comes out from the surface of a star. You can then use your knowledge of physics, the fundamental laws of physics, to imagine and to calculate likely processes that are taking place inside that star. And if you get a match to uh, the surface of the star, the, what you can measure, then he said, then you can have some reasonable confidence that you're on the right lines with what's going on inside. But you must, and, he, and, and Eddington was really clear in this emphasis, you must always be your own worst critic. You must always be highly sceptical of your model and always open to reinterpreting it, tweaking it and modifying it, or perhaps even throwing it out completely. Now, he was roundly assaulted for this, um, especially by Jeans, who said that this was, this, this was actually undermining the thing that made science as a route to knowledge a special, important thing. And Eddington sort of developed this, this, this idea of, of conviction science, belief in your model, because what he was showing was that if you assumed, and it was an assumption, that stars were powered by nuclear fusion in their centres, then you needed a certain temperature for fusion to take place. And you could take um, the measurements of the mass of stars, calculate densities, and try to work out what that central temperature would be. And he found it was far, far lower than was needed to spark nuclear fusion. He was attacked for this and said, well, clearly the model is wrong. Jean, um, Eddington, however, said, well, that doesn't prove I'm wrong. In fact, let's turn it all around. I believe that this is the most likely thing that, that can power a star, nuclear fusion in the center. Therefore, I challenge all of the naysayers to go and find me a place in the universe that's hotter. You know, find me something that will do it better than, than my idea, and then I'll go down your route. If not, leave me alone, and we'll keep working with this particular model. Well, we now know that the temperature derived classically for um, where nuclear fusion will take place is too high. And that as soon as you start to look at the quantum properties of particles, the temperature needed for nuclear fusion to take place tumbles and tumbles right down into the realm where Eddington had calculated, giving significant boost to his model. Still not proof, however, because he couldn't measure directly into the centre of the sun or any other stars. Because of the progress of science, however, it seems that nature, rather like fairy godmothers, does sometimes grant wishes. And the discovery of the particle known as the neutrino was a way to directly measure what was happening in the nuclear core of the sun. And finally, we have direct access, and we can turn Eddington's models into highly um, probable, almost certain understanding of stars. So belief in models and conviction science does work. So the next few things we're going to talk about now are where we have only models and hypotheses. And the first one is to look at dark matter. Where did, where did that come from? What's the chain of, of, of events and progress that, that got us to this thinking? Well, I suppose it begins with um, Isaac Newton and 1687, when he managed to encapsulate uh, the force of gravity in just five mathematical symbols. His famous equation, GMM over R squared. F equals GMM over R squared. And this allowed 
movement, natural movement, as they, as they thought of it, um, to be calculated, things that were falling. As you move out into the universe itself, gravity is the defining force. It's the architect of the universe. Things move in astronomy just because of gravitation. And that meant that as soon as we started identifying these huge spiral galaxies and looking at the way they move, they should move according to Newton's laws. And that's when the problems started. So there's, a, there's one story about the beginning of our, of our um, realization of dark matter that revolves around um, uh, the, the astronomer, the outspoken astronomer Fritz Zwicky. So is there anyone here of a, of a slightly sensitive disposition? Because one of Zwicky's favourite words was bastard. <laughs> he would call everyone that as some kind of term of endearment. <laughs> his students remember um, that uh, they arrived at his, at his house, for, invited for, um, for, for, a, for a, a barbecue or a little get-together. And his wife um, announced them as exactly that saying that they're here, the bastards are here. <laughs> if he really didn't like you, he'd add the word spherical to the, uh, uh, to the noun, because that meant you were one no matter what direction you were looked at from. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> um, so Zwicky was just looking at the way these galaxies revolve around each other in these big clusters. And uh, what he found was that they were moving so quickly around one another um, that it was it, as if there was more matter in these clusters of galaxies than the, the stars could produce. You could, you could calculate how much gravity was needed to keep these galaxies bound and in orbit around one another, and then you could calculate how much gravity they were um, generating based upon the amount of stars that you saw and there was a huge discrepancy. So he said that there must be some form of, um, of dark matter in there. I suppose what he really meant was, was invisible or difficult to see matter. Uh, that was in the 1930s, and there were a number of other observations. It crops up um, with regularity in every time you start looking at galactic movement through the papers of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And yet still no one kind of takes it on board fully. No one, no, no one totally embraces that idea that there is missing matter, for want of a better word, until about the 1970s. Uh, and that's when spectroscopes became um, reasonably um, advanced enough so that you could um, not just look at the bulk motion of a galaxy, but the way it's rotating. And here, um, what you expected was that the main bulk of the galaxy was at the centre. So that's rather like the solar system with most of the mass in the sun. And then all the stars on the outside edges are all more or less revolving around that main bulk there in the centre. So you should expect orbits of the stars very similar to the way that the planets orbit the sun in the solar system. And that means um, quite quick orbits and quite high orbital velocities close by, dropping away to, to lower orbital velocities further away. Um, in fact, what was clearly being seen were rotation curves where the outer edges of the galaxy were moving as quickly, if not more quickly, than the stars in the interior. And this was a pattern that was um, followed for all, uh, across nearly all of the spiral galaxies and other galaxies that were looked at. So clearly, something is up. You can do one of two things at this point. You, know, you can say that this galaxy and all the galaxies have failed, um, that the, or, or the Newtonian gravity has failed 
to, to predict um, and explain these rotation curves. And at that point, you can do one of two things. You can say, OK, Newtonian gravity is wrong. It, it's only been tested on the Earth in relatively small astronomical scales with the planets in the solar systems, the nearby stars. Um, but on these much, much larger scales, something is different. There's, a, there's an unanticipated facet of gravity that, that we haven't grasped yet. Or you can say, no, I'm going to assume that Newton is right, even in these untested realms. And that means I have to then put more matter in. I need to, to if, if there's more uh, velocity, more energy in these stars, I need to apply a greater force to get them to move like that. And so you're driven down the line of more matter somewhere. Well, trying to flatten rotation curves and trying to come up with some sort of solution with matter distribution that would do this um, led to the idea that if you imagine that this is, is a spiral galaxy here, this is the disk of the galaxy, this is the central bulge, um, then surrounding it is a huge sphere which gets called a halo and that's where this, this dark matter is. That's pulling, that's pulling the stars in all directions from the disk and overwhelming this central bulge. So it's the halo that's helping define the way that the stars move. And if you do that, and if you do the, the very f the simplest um, kind of distribution in this halo that you can imagine, which is just to put a uniform density of matter all the way through the sphere, it does uh, flatten the rotation curve and you get something um, that looks as if it's going along the right lines. So quite reasonably, you think, excellent. There's, there is the possible solution. So the next thing to do with this model is to think, well, what, what would make it more realistic? Well, for a start, um, understanding what these particles are would be, would be good. Um, before that, however, they're, they're clearly gravitating so, because they're pulling the stars. So you then start to say, well, OK, I've just done a uniform distribution. What would a more natural, more realistic distribution be like? And of course, if they're gravitating, they're going to clump. And mainly, they're going to clump towards the centre and get more rarefied as you go outwards. As soon as you start doing that, the flat rotation curve breaks and the fit gets worse. Okay, you say, there must be some properties of whatever these dark matter particles are that help keep it more rarefied and stop letting it be, be so clumpy. And you can move to models where there's uh, there, where they're, um, lower mass but moving more quickly, for example. So in all these ways, you suddenly start inch by inch down a path where you feel like you're getting to know a huge amount about this unseen substance. But all the time, you might be walking down a cul-de-sac. Now, confidence in this idea that there was dark matter and that there, there must be undiscovered particles of nature as coming from particle physics at the time. If you're a particle physicist and you want to develop an idea about how a force works or how forces interrelate with one another, your stock in trade are particles. That, that is what you use. That's your currency. And the history of particle physics over the 20th century was that hypothetical particles discovered through theoretical calculations were then being discovered in laboratories. The neutrino that we talked about, for example, predicted on paper first. Antimatter predicted on paper first. Other particles as well. This was a clearly tried and tested route of particle physics, extremely successful. And what they were saying was that there were the possibilities for other undiscovered particles. 
as you try to understand where all the forces of nature come from and how they interact. And this seemed to be exactly what the astronomers would need to make up their dark matter. Now, the trouble with all of this is that the dark matter itself must be, um, uh, must be not very reactive. The best form of uh, the, the, or, or the, the most likely, the best candidate for the dark matter um, that we have at the moment is sort of known as the WIMP. And that's a weakly interacting massive particle. It's weakly interacting because it uses this force of nature known as the weak nuclear force, which is the same force used by the neutrino to interact. So if you can build a neutrino detector, the possibility exists to build a WIMP detector as well. And there are now numerous WIMP detectors around the world, all of them cutting into the the the, the, the theoretical parameter space of where WIMPs might exist. And some of these detectors, they use sort of um, crystals, some of them, to um, see the, uh, the, the recoil of a, of a nucleus from an atom when it's occasionally, very occasionally, hit by a WIMP. These are some of the detectors here. Some of them appear to be seeing something, but they're not the kinds of WIMPs that theory is telling you that they should be. They seem to be much lighter. Also, one dark matter experiment can see something, and another one, just sitting next to it, um, sees nothing. Sometimes they're even made of the same detecting crystal, and they're not seeing the same as one another. So it's all confusion. We may get some clarity reasonably soon. The Large Hadron Collider um, is starting, or has started up, and one of the um, best routes for particle physics to produce uh, these WIMPs is through something called supersymmetry. And this is a hypothesis um, that would um, mean that there are vast swathes of other particles in the universe. The Large Hadron Collider should make them, um, if you want sort of technical um, quantification, it will make them by the bucket load. Um, and they will, they, will, they, will, they will spirit energy out of the, of, of, of the reaction. You'll, you'll catch all the known particles in the detectors and then these wimps will just pass through unseen and you'll see that in a deficit of input energy against output energy. If they see them, it's, it's profound. It's extraordinary. Uh, it doesn't quite mean that they will be dark matter particles. They might just be... Um, particles that make these forces work, but there might not be enough of them to be the dark matter, they might not be long-lived enough, they might be too light. So, but if they see them, it's, it's an incredible thing. It would also mean, as we'll talk, it would also have profound influence on um, a thing called dark energy, which we'll look at in a second. But just one thing to mention before we leave dark matter behind, and that's when I said to you that if you you know, if you don't want to believe in dark matter, then it's, it's a modification of gravity. Um, dark matter comes about because of this assumption that Newton's gravity holds throughout the universe on these weak scales. If you don't believe that, however, and that gravity may change, may modify itself in some way, um, can you get any further down the line there? Well, an Israeli physicist called Mordecai Mildrom um, attacked this problem. And he said, what would I need to do to Newton's laws um, in order to make them fit the rotation curves of the galaxies? Um, is there some simple change to that force law? And he found a very simple change. And it's a tiny extra term that sits on Newton's equation. It's so small, this term, that it's negligible on everyday scales of gravity. It only comes into play, according to Milgram, in the kind of gravitational field that's generated by a sheet of A4 paper. 
And if you were to put a sheet of A4 paper into empty space, the gravitational field that that would generate would not quite follow Newton's law. It would be slightly stronger. A decay, the inverse square decay of Newton's law would, would, would level off a little bit, meaning that in the very outer reaches of a galaxy where the stellar density is extremely low and stars are very, very far away from the galactic centre, you could reach these modified Newtonian dynamic limits, meaning that gravity would pull you a little harder and the stars would travel a little faster. And when Milgram put this um, equation into, uh, into action, he found that these are the data points for rotation curves of a typical galaxy. This is um, what just Newton's law gives you. The red line is the approximate fit you get from Newtonian laws with extra dark matter in some kind of halo. The modified Newtonian dynamics fits the best. But what does it mean? Where does it come from? As yet, there's no route to understanding where this might come from, from theory. What it may be, it may be telling you that this is the behaviour that you need to um, approach with dark matter. Maybe it's telling you that this is some sort of way that dark matter behaves and that we need to get it to, to, to do this rather than just assume it's just a, a powerful you know, gravity sort of generating device. Or it's telling us that there's a modification of gravity out there to be found that we haven't seen yet. Well, let's um, quickly move on, as time is pressing, um, to this dark energy. So... Here, um, in the mid-90s, uh, groups of astronomers were um, measuring the expansion rate of the universe. And they were looking to try and quantify the amount of matter that was in, uh, in our cosmos by looking for the rate at which the expansion slowed down over time. They were looking and gauging distances by using a special kind of supernova, an exploding star, in which gas from one star is fed down onto a white dwarf star, which tips it over a very specific mass limit, the Chandrasekhar limit of 1.4 solar masses. That means that as it tips over that limit, the white dwarf star collapses, igniting a cataclysmic nuclear explosion. Because it always happens at that mass limit, more or less, the explosion, the brightness, the luminosity is pretty constant. So these are great standard candles for seeing through the universe. And what they saw is when they looked at the furthest sweeps of space, it seemed that the expansion was actually going more slowly in the past than it is today. That was exactly opposite to what they thought they should be seeing. Faster expansion earlier on, and then because of the action of gravity holding everything together and slowing down that expansion, slower in the modern day. But no, that's not what they saw. So what is it that's, that's accelerating the expansion? Is this a new force of nature? Or is this gravity behaving in a different way Again, something away from Newton's ideas of how gravity behaved. There's another idea is that it could be energy in space, something that Einstein toyed with. And of course, it's, frankly, it's astonishing we've got 40 minutes into a cosmology talk without mentioning Einstein yet. <laughs> um, so let's do that right now. So Einstein is famous for developing a new theory of gravity, one that extended Newton's ideas. And if Newton's idea was that gravity was like the tension in a piece of string connecting two objects, Einstein's idea was... Einstein's idea um, was that the, the, the gravity itself was like a landscape. Um, this is the carpet that I want in my front room. Um, this is in it's in, a, it's in a game shop I think in in, um, in Paris uh, and this landscape these the gradient 
gives you the force of gravity at all these different places. Well, dark energy then becomes a distortion in this space-time continuum, something that's, that's powering the expansion. But that, too, rests on an assumption. And that is that in order to solve his equations of general relativity and get a solution, Einstein assumed that the density of matter and energy was the same everywhere. That's still an assumption that is thought by most to be absolutely valid today. However, in the course of the history of the universe, as we've seen, the original picture of the, of, 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 from Planck showed a uniform sea of gas with tiny, tiny fluctuations, one part in a million or so, uh, 100 million or something like that. Today, 60% of the volume of the universe is in voids of matter. All that gas has been collected together into galaxies, individual clusters of galaxies that now make up about 40% of the universe. So the question is, is it still valid to believe that we can uh, just imagine all the density of matter smoothed out across the universe and still solve Einstein's equations in the way that's traditionally been done for almost a century now? Or is it true that you have to look at things differently? That in the 60% where there are voids, the expansion rate will be faster than in the 40% where there are clusters. If you relax that assumption and start doing those calculations, some people believe that as matter falls into clusters of galaxies, opening up these large voids, then you can make an, a phenomenon that appears to be like an acceleration. The beauty of this, of course, is that these are firmly mathematical predictions. And so with the next um, sweep of survey telescopes, like ESA's Euclid mission, we should, I hope, be able to sort between these ideas and, and, and try to, to, to home in on whether it's a new force of nature, whether it's an energy spread throughout the space-time continuum, or whether we just need to get smarter in the way we solve the equations of general relativity and not be so simplistic about it. Well, again, I can't believe now that we've got 43 minutes into a talk without mentioning black holes. Um, so let's do them. Black holes come out of general relativity. They are a prediction of the theory, and they also are the mile markers of our understanding of the universe. This is really um, a, a, a full-on confrontation of the unknown universe. Here is um, a simulation, a computer model, of a black hole. This is the, the, the famous one that was done for the film Interstellar, um, based on the equations of relativity. This is what the gravitational field around a black hole would do with, um, with, with light. And we're all very happy with what's happening um, sort of at this level. It's what happens um, inside the black hole itself. So with the black hole, you have the, the, the event horizon. That's the, that is the region of space where if you cross it, you can never escape again. The question is, is that a true boundary? Is that a surface in some way? Or is it just empty space? And you can just cross it, you can be inside the event horizon and not know about it until you try to get out. If that's the case, matter has just been collapsed all the way down into the thing right at the very centre, this point of infinite density, which is the singularity. And what happens there? So this is, it's around, it's between the event horizon and the singularity that, that Einstein can't really take us. His theory reaches its limits here. And this is why um, we're needing to look on extremely small scales as we get down here. So we have to try to develop a quantum theory of gravity, the way gravity works on its very, very smallest scales. 
But the catch is, how do you test that? Because you have the event horizon, and you cannot get information out of the event horizon. So you can develop a quantum theory of gravity, but how do you test it? And this is kind of where we are with string theory at the moment. That's the most promising, highly promising actually, um, idea for a graviton particle and something that would give us a, a workable quantum theory. But finding tests for it is extremely difficult. The singularity itself is mathematically reminiscent of the Big Bang. And this brings us on to our sort of last um, little thing to uh, talk about. And that's this idea of cosmic inflation. This uniform um, universe that we had in the beginning with just these miniature, minuscule fluctuations on it, that's a peculiar thing. Because the universe doesn't know that, for, uh, that one side is the same as the other. It hasn't had time to communicate. It hasn't had time to swap energy and become um, in, into sort of thermal equilibrium and equalize the temperature. And so this model, this hypothesis of something, of cosmic inflation was, was, was born. Beautiful idea, actually, that something after the initial Big Bang suddenly caused the, the, the universe to accelerate its expansion by a, a phenomenal rate, smoothing out everything in its path, essentially. And then the general expansion of the universe took over. This is the release of the microwave background long after inflation um, finished, in fact, but still possibly holding the, the, the fingerprints, the imprints of this process. And then the expansion starts to, to take place, and then gradually we're sort of starting to accelerate the expansion here. So how do you prove cosmic inflation may have taken place? Well, it comes from signatures that may be imprinted on this microwave um, background. And if you remember last year, those signatures, this pattern of polarization, um, was thought to have been discovered. I love this picture. This is the BICEP telescope here on the South Pole where these observations were made. One of the reasons I like about it is because it looks like something out of a horror movie. Um, for these people who were the BICEP team, that's sort of what this all turned into. Um, they, I mean, they honestly thought that they had seen this pattern and it was an extraordinary um, moment to be able to say that from paper, you know, from theory, from hypothesis and mathematics, you had found out something almost unbelievable about the universe, that it, something just drove it to inflate in this way. And now you had found the telltale characteristic of it. Um, it's just extraordinary. But the very night um, of the announcement, and I'd been working on it um, for almost a week because I'd been given a tip-off um, about it the week before. I got a phone call from, uh, it was really late at night, but I got a phone call from a, 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 a highly respected cosmologist. And, or an email rather, uh, very late at night. And um, he just said to me, in all this euphoria, no one's realizing the downside. And the downside is that Inflation takes anything and turns it into this featureless universe from which as then from which gravity does its thing and we get our cosmos out of it. So what that means, however, is because it can take anything and render it featureless featureless, you can never know the details of the Big Bang. It's like having that singularity in the black hole surrounded by the event horizon that you can't get information out of. If cosmic inflation is true, then it means that there are probably 
hard limits to the knowledge that we can have about the origin of our <coughs> universe. And that this era of quantum gravity, oh, just up in here where the Big Bang took place, this other era where quantum gravity is really, really important and the dominant thing, is probably lost to us, impossible to probe. So again, even if we fully develop quantum gravity scenarios, how do we test them? How do we turn it actually into science? Or have we reached the limits of that and now we're in the realm of mathematical belief systems? I therefore breathed um, a, a, a hearty sigh of relief um, when it was discovered that actually the, the bicep um, results were the result of, of this dust, um, the microwave emission from the dust in front of um, the cosmological signal. So cosmic inflation has not been proven. Uh, the, 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 the paper is, um, uh, was rewritten, the results were re represented. It could be that there are a number of other uh, uh, experiments looking for this same signature. They could see it any day, in which case cosmic inflation is true. It is the most extraordinary human achievement to have discovered that, but it puts a very hard limit on, the, on, on science and what we can know about the universe. And the final thing um, to leave you with is that, um, as I've sort of indicated throughout all of this, we have based our understanding of the universe on a series of assumptions. And we have developed those into a model, the standard model of the universe, in which there is 4 or 5% of normal matter, a quarter of the rest of it is dark matter, two th uh, another three quarters almost is dark energy. But it's just a model. It's just a model. So the final thing is just to beware of models, beware of assumptions, and be sceptical. And not to be afraid of empiricism. Not to be afraid of, of finding mathematical descriptions which don't yet come from theory and paying full attention to them. Because back in the first decades of the 17th century, Johannes Kepler derived three laws of planetary motion. None of those laws was based in theory. In fact, they were based in his erroneous belief in the harmony of the spheres, that actually the universe had to be beautiful because it had been crafted by God himself. And yet, these laws hold absolutely and were subsequently explained by Newton's law of gravity that gave it the theoretical underpinning. Same for relativity. The Lorentz transformation, which is central to special relativity, was developed by Lorentz before it was given the theoretical underpinning of relativity. So, Let's just be sceptical. Let's constantly keep thinking that we might be on the wrong tracks, but let's also keep our fingers crossed for um, the first detection of dark matter and a true theory of what dark energy might be. And if you can wait until September, um, <laughs> then you can read all about it. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, and uh, that's good advice on which to end his talk and just the disappointing inability to plug his book in quite the way they'd like today, but I'm sure you can look for it on Amazon and similar places later in the year. Um, we do have time for a few questions. Can I ask, I'm going to take them uh, as chair in, in reasonable order, can I ask that if you get to answer a, uh, ask a question even, that you wait for the microphone to come to you and then uh, speak into it from there because we're recording the answers and hoping to put this online in the near future. So, uh, let's start, Madam. Thank you very much for that really fascinating lecture. Uh, last week we had a, a lecture by Catherine Fraser, or Fries, I don't know how she pronounces it, about dark matter. And she ended by saying that it's possible that dark matter actually isn't made up of particles at all, and that we might need super, superhuman brains to understand it. 
different brains all together. What would you say to that? Uh, I would say that before you went down that route, um, have a look at the alternatives. Have a look at the fundamental physics. See if that can work. Um, it, it, it's, it is true that the universe may be beyond their comprehension and that for all the advances that we've had in science over the last few centuries, that we are hitting the buffers. That may be absolutely true and, and that we may need superhuman brains to understand what's going on.